Hello, hello, my beauties and bees, and welcome to another installment of uh, Cryptic Corner for ya, where we explore the unexplained, the supernatural, the paranormal and hidden, the mysterious, the alien, the accursed, and the forbidden. I'm your host, Miss Bumble Bree, and uh, today we are going to be exploring uh, something a little, a little different, um, because... We cover a lot of cryptids and a lot of ghosts. Uh, we even covered machines like killbots. Um, but today's machines are something special, sort of a cultural phenomena. I'd say even right up there with clowns, and that's the the haunted or cursed cars uh, of of uh, history. So let me let me tell you. Um, maybe this is. Uh, a lot very American centric, but movies like uh, Maximum Overdrive and, and uh, Christine about the the cars that become sentient and start uh, start committing acts of horror and uh, mayhem were always uh, a favorite of mine um, because where I grew up and like I said it's maybe American centric. I was like right down from a truck lot, so uh, the, the 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 diner scene and everything was like really close to home for me, and uh, so it made it all that much uh, all that much more real and, and immersive for me uh, to watch. Like, well, they they made trucks too. They made trucks into its own movie as well. Maximum Overdrive is based on a short story or a story by Stephen King called Trucks. So Christine's by Stephen King too. Stephen King was really uh, into this concept as well. And I guess uh, there's an episode of uh, Futurama where Bender becomes a wear car that has the, 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 that steals from this theme that I just love. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's sort of a trope, but it has its roots in some historical vehicles. So um, today we are going to be uh, diving into that. So the channel that we're watching is called uh, The Strangest. Mm, pretty big channel, 15K, so. That is pretty big, I don't know. Bigger than mine. But, you know, let's, let's hear what they have to say. All right, hold on. Gotta fix the audio on this one, too. Do, 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 switch it to my headphones. There we go. All right. Welcome back, strangers. Everyone remembers their first car. You finally have the freedom to go anywhere. Many people's first big purchase in life is a car. Yet so much. My first car was a Pontiac Sunbird, which I bought for five hundred and sixty dollars off of a lot, and I drove it for a whole four days before the engine blew up in black smoke. Uh, when I was sixteen, it was it was rough. It had a T top too, which I really liked. <sighs> I thought it was super cool driving around on my Pontiac Sunbird, but alas, it was not meant to be. And then, so I had it for four weeks, and then after that, I ended up with a, what did I end up with? Did I have a Cav Chevy Cavalier? Yeah. <laughs> I had a Chevy Cavalier, a little blue one, and I drove that thing all over the place. I drove, I uh, had to had to replace the flywheel on it and stuff all kinds of work that was done on it but eventually then i traded that in and i got a uh i got a pretty kick-ass uh big blue 1981 dodge ram cargo van and that's where the fun really started uh you know because we could go to festivals and uh we could go campsites and everything else and not have to yeah, anyway, uh, reminiscing about my youth and my big blue van with the, uh, yeah, <laughs> we had like a, a, it was one of those Papasan chairs, you know, the, the round chairs. It was a cushion for one of those laid in the back there for a, uh, and then it was like a kind of hippie, kind of 90s, kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of, well, we were, we were like uh, mall goth kids, so we had lots of like corn posters and stuff hanging up and Rob Zombie. How much time and money goes into funding the perfect car at the right price from the least shadiest salesman or previous owner you can find and somehow trust. But you never know until it's too late if you got a good deal or a lemon that you'll end up regretting all the repairs that you have to pay for just to simply keep the car on the road. 
there's always a little mystery to that car that you'll end up driving so many hours, sometimes zoning out, texting, and not paying attention to everyone around you that- Do not text and drive. Just don't. What do we have here? Uh, my mom loved older, the older ones too. Her first car was a Beetle. Um, my first car was a, was a 70s Dodge Diplomat with bad brakes. Practically had to stop Flintstone style. Planting both your feet, huh? Both, yeah. Meet Fred Flintstone. Uh, that's George Jetson. <laughs> 1972 Charger had to fix it almost every time I drove it. 72 Charger is a nice car, though. It's a really nice car for a kid to have. And before I drove it, but it was still awesome to have a car, yeah. Uh-huh. At any moment, you could potentially injure or kill. Today, we're going to discuss the five haunted and cursed cars that ruined the lives of their owners and those closest to them. The best way to begin is with the car that inspired Stephen King's Christine. The car is a 1964 Dodge 330 limited edition dubbed the Golden Eagle. The deadly car- Yeah, but uh, Christine was a Plymouth Fury though, just to be clear. And this is a Plymouth Fury right here, and the Golden Eagle wasn't red. Christine is red. Um, and this picture of her is kind of washed out, but yeah, she was like a candy apple red. Or is connected to the deaths of at least 14 people, and has been called the most evil car in America. It was originally purchased by the Old Orchard Beach Police Department in Maine and used as a cop car. The police department then sold the car to a local elderly man after the three officers who drove the car regularly all died in strange but separate murder suicides where they each killed their and Stephen friends. King actually wrote another book about this, about the uh, another uh, version of this story about the actual with the police car and everything. Uh, it's like a Buick, uh, a Buick 8. Is that what it's and called? And then themselves. Yeah. The infamous Dodge eventually became the car of Wendy Allen and her family. They never encountered the violent side of the vehicle, but the car doors would randomly fly open while driving down the highway. The car's creepy reputation attracted a lot of teenage vandals in the 80s and 90s. Supposedly, all the unfortunate vandals died soon after terrorizing the car. Four were struck by lightning, and one group was decapitated in a horrendous crash involving their car and an 18-wheeler. Two young children. That's sad. Um, this is this is like uh, the kind of cursed stuff they do with um, like King Tut's tomb or the Hope Diamond, right? They're like anybody anybody who comes in contact with that, uh, no matter when they die, it's because of the curse. You know, whether it's four years down the road or fourteen years down the road. It's always going to be the curse that's, that's killing them. One in the 80s and another in the 90s who went with their older siblings to vandalize the car were eventually killed when they were crossing the street and hit by a car that was going so fast it appeared like it came out of nowhere. One poor kid in 2008 simply touched the cursed car and a few weeks later he murdered his family, dog, and burned his house down. See, this is like urban legend stuff. Let's look at the actual lore around this one, though. The murderous motorized Golden Eagle, North America's most bloodthirsty car. While doing research for my Behind the, cre the, the Crime Scene tape blog, I come across stories about murderers, abusers, poisoners, and psychopaths. But for all the evil that's strolling through the world, I would never have guessed that an antique car could be called evil. Yes, I have heard of the Stephen King classic, Christine. I, it seems old Steve based Christine on a real murderous car, a 1964 Dodge 330 limited edition nicknamed Golden Eagle. Fans of Stephen King will know he centers his tale in Maine. He and uh, Golden Eagle both call this picture a state home. The author writes horror while the car's legend is horrifying. <laughs> Not much is known about the car before it was sold to the Old Orchard Police Force. Three separate officers drove it, and all three of them murdered their families before taking their own lives. In a town of fewer than 8,000 people, what are the odds of so many murder-suicides? Needless to say, the force got rid of the car. Yeah, because it's got to be the car, right? It can't be that your uh, hiring practices might be questionable and you're hiring psychopaths. 
That can't be a possibility. It's got to be the cursed car. I digress. We'll read on. Needless to say, the force got rid of the car, selling it to an elderly man who apparently gave it to its current owner, Wendy Allen. Members of the local church vehemently disagreed with keeping the so-called demon car in their town and vandalized it in some kind of warped exorcism. It has had the opposite effect. According to the Golden Eagles owners, the vandals were all killed quite violently. Some were decapitated in automobile accidents and a few others were struck by lightning with one more being claimed and yet another murder-suicide. You have to feel bad for those who were decapitated. We could only hope it was quick, unlike that poor fellow. Unlike this poor fellow. Let's see. I don't know what that has to do with anything we're reading here. <laughs> the car is reportedly to blame for the deaths of two teens hit by another car before being flung onto the hood of the Golden Eagle where they died. In 2007, another brave teen dared to merely touch the car, which he did, uh, being full of bravado and bluster. Weeks later, he murdered his family and set their home ablaze. No one is entirely sure why. Okay. And that's got to be the car, too. Um, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Ah. <sighs> uh. In uh, 2010, another group of churchgoers stole the car, had it chopped up and taken apart, and sent the pieces to a bunch of different junkyards. Miss Allen is a self-proclaimed car collector, and with help from supporters, raised necessary funds to find many of her beloved car's pieces. Others could not be found and had to be replaced completely. The car was restored to the point that the owner was able to use it as her daily driver. Miss Allen claims the vandals and church folk brought the curse on themselves, targeting her because of her beliefs in the occult. Some even went as far as to accuse her of witchcraft, using the car as her tool to cast death spells. All told, though, the car is apparently responsible for anywhere from 14 to 32 deaths, depending on who you listen to. Interestingly enough, Miss Allen lives in Old Orchard Beach, she claims the car has never hurt any of her family, despite its tendency to fling the doors open while driving down the highway. One good thing, uh, good thing for seatbelts, right? Apparently, the car has figured out how to release those, too. But uh, these days, the car remains hidden away for its own safety. Miss Allen has cashed in on her infamy by claiming to be the founder of the Church of the Holy Rhinestones. <laughs> in her is her car a killer or is she concocted the story for 15 minutes of fame yes yeah, seems like it maybe she's spinning this yarn right that's that's the vibes i'm getting that this story comes from miss allen herself maybe the car did have the bad history with the police department which where she got it but everything else seems to be word of mouth from miss allen yeah bottleneck jack um they like to live dangerously in 2010, a church group stole the car and took it apart. They believed a demon was inhabiting the vehicle, so they chopped it up and distributed the different parts of the car to various junkyards, so the car could never be whole again. Owner Wendy Allen was able to use the internet to help retrieve most of the car, but is currently sitting in pieces and hidden from future vandals. Many That's not what that story I just read said. And that's why I'm glad I, I'm checking in on this. I don't know which one of those things is true. Story just read said that uh, she had it restored and is able to drive it now. Of course, this is from five years ago in the this blog. I had to replace some of the parts. This blog is from yeah, just a few years ago, just in twenty, just three years ago. So, yeah, maybe they've, 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 things changed between then and now. I'll give in that. Okay. Do you remember the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand that began World War One? After years of building tension between the nations of Europe, on Sunday, June 28th, 1914. That's the, the, from a Buick 8, that's the one I was talking about. So that's the one where he decided to go back and, uh, where Stephen King went back and decided to write a horror story about, basically about those cops, um, or based around those cops in, the, in that car. Christine was based around that car too, but in a different way. 
Because, you know, there was never a Plymouth Fury on a police force, right? Never a red Plymouth Fury on a cop you know, uh, as a police car. <laughs> the murder car of Theseus. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, all the pieces, right? Does every, every car that uses one of those pieces is going to be, like, have a horcrux of um, pristine in them. Him and his wife were attacked when an assassin threw a grenade at their car. However, the grenade missed and injured innocent bystanders. After visiting the governor's residence, Ferdinand and his wife took his open-air limo to visit those innocent people at the hospital who were injured in the attack earlier that day. Unfortunately, Ferdinand's trusty limo stalled when another assassin walked out of the cafe and saw the Archduke and his wife sitting there out in the open. The assassin shot his target and his wife through the head and throats. But that was only the beginning of the misery connected to the death limo. During the next 12 years, the limo was owned by 15 different people and involved right. in several accidents that led to 13 deaths. Not counting the over 17... This is the Franz Ferdinand uh, limo. <laughs> so, I actually learned this part of the history from this, but now since I these other stuff, well, I'll take his word for it on this. people who were killed as a result from World War I that all began with the cursed car. The next owner was an Austrian general who went insane while driving the car through Vienna, causing him to be committed to an asylum where he would eventually die. The governor of Yugoslavia became the new owner of the cursed limo. At first, he loved it. And did not Wait, did that just say he went? He just like went crazy because he had the car. And, and, and did he go crazy because he had the car, or did he go crazy and he had the car because? Correlation is not causation. I believe any of the superstitions surrounding it until he was involved in four different accidents involving the car. In the last accident, he lost his arm, prompting him to finally sell the car to his friend who was a doctor. The doctor only bought. If you think a car is cursed, are you going to sell it to your friend? I mean, if I thought a car was cursed, I would sell it to an enemy. <laughs> no, I probably wouldn't sell it to anybody. I mean, what are you going to do? You're gonna, you, you, you basically be responsible for, if, if you really like truly believed it was cursed and then whoever owns this is going to have misfortune and potentially death and you sell it to them anyway. I mean, I guess if you give them a disclaimer about it and that's maybe why they want to buy it, like an occult museum or something, that's a different story. The limo on a dare and within six months he was killed when he flipped the car over in an accident that crushed him. A captain in the German army bought the vehicle, but died when he crashed the car trying to avoid two pedestrians crossing the road. However, he somehow still managed to hit them, and all three were killed in the accident. Soon after, a Swiss race car driver was killed when he flipped the limo, when he decided to take it out for a joy ride, not believing any of the superstitions surrounding it. The farmer who towed the wrecked limo back was crushed by the car when it fell on him before he could finish towing it back into town. Jeez, that would, uh... That would suck, <laughs> driving a wrecker and having to, uh, I imagine this limo probably weighs quite a bit. We'll look at pictures of it in a second. The final victims were a Romanian man who owned the car and his friends in 1962. The unfortunate group were killed on their way to a wedding when the death limo spun out of control. All five in the car were killed. Finally, the car was donated to the War History Museum of Vienna, where it still sits, possibly waiting for its next victim, who is brave enough to take it out for a drive. The All right, so we're going to go look at that now. So we got the history, it's Halloween special. <laughs> so Archduke Franz Ferdinand's 1910 Graf and Stift Double Phaeton, which looks like that. The history of the automobile is not a long one, spanning less than 130 years, and yet the amount of history and legend surrounding the device, and in particular, uh, specific examples is expansive uh, as such when I wanted to research something creepy for spooky uh, or spooky involving automobiles this year for this year's Halloween uh, themed uh, history hits I faced was faced with a huge amount of uh, source material <laughs> stories of haunted cars cursed cars and even cars that uh, possess a murder a murderous intent of their own all abound and yet none of these seemed proper for an article for the article at hand almost all these stories involve some sort of legend or paranormal activity 
and it did not feel right putting speculation and heresy under the banner of history. So rather than looking for spooky cars, uh, instead I decided to look for uh, cars with a proven tra track record of decidedly unlucky passengers. Below is the car that may have the worst luck and certainly has one of the worst histories uh, events attached to it and yeah talking about world war one and that i was able to find and confirm so yeah first we get franz ferdinand uh one of the most important is assassinations with the longest felt effect is that of austro-hungarian empire's archduke franz ferdinand and his wife sophie uh this unfortunate event is considered the uh imp impetus for the beginning of the First World War and is one of the earliest assassination events wherein an automobile played a central role. The automobile in question is an early automobile produced by Graf and Stift, an early luxury car maker located in Austria. In 19, the 1910 model was produced in a double Phaeton style of a limousine it was not actually the Archduke's car at all, as the automobile was still in its infancy. The royalty of the Empire did not travel with or in their own vehicles, but rather sourced what they needed at their destination. The car the Archduke was passenger in on that fateful day of the 28th of June, 1914, along with... Uh, belong not to a royal, but rather a to a logistic officer, one Count Franz von Harak. Count von Harak was m more than likely an appointed officer. I could find little information on him, on who served in the Austrian Army Transport Corps. His vehicle was equipped with not uh, not at all powerful. 31.5 uh, HP horsepower engine um, and would prove to be unfamiliar with the driver of the Archduke. This unfamiliarity would prove a factor in his killing. While touring Sarajevo in Serbia on this day, several would-be assassins were positioning themselves around his route, preparing to take his life in hopes of furthering their cause. It was one of these men who threw a bomb at the motor vehicle early in the day, only to be met with failure. The bomb bounced off the folded convertible top of the Archduke's car, bouncing under his entourage follow, uh, following, exploding and injuring many. It was this failure that would prove key to the Archduke's death, for with, with it, the Archduke changed his route from the... Uh, pre-prescribed one and the remainder of his would-be assassins fled their post. It was one of these assassins, 19-year-old Gavril uh, Principe, who pulled the trigger of that fateful shot which killed Archduke and his wife after a series of coincidences. 19-year-olds sure looked old back then. That's crazy. After wandering off from his initial post, Princip was or had been hungry and went to purchase some food at a local cafe. And while earlier the Archduke and his wife had decided to visit the men injured by the earlier attempt on his life and set off for the hospital where they were staying, while a local general had cleared the route for them, his driver was not informed the route and was unfamiliar with the city anyhow. On the way to the hospital uh, with the Archduke and his wife, he made a wrong turn and quickly realized his mistake. Attempted to make a multi-point U-turn, unfortunately, where he attempted the turn was directly in front of the cafe Princip was visiting. The driver, uh, wrestling with the unfamiliar route and equally unfamiliar vehicle, stalled midway through the turn, a bare five foot from where Princip was standing a few seconds later, the two shots from Princip's pistol and the Archduke and his wife were mortally wounded. It was a series of unfortunate events capped by a stalling car presenting a stationary target 
which led to the death of the Archduke and the start of the First World War uh, and the death of millions. If it uh, were not a morbid enough history for this unfortunate limousine, further legends surround this particular vehicle. While most are disprovable hogwash, such as the stories of it following its owner, owners all coming to disastrous ends, usually uh, following are uh, usually involving cars, just car destroying scenarios and impossibility as the car is well preserved and on display. One of the stories does prove to hold enough truth for retelling for nearly a century. The odd coincidence that the, the car's license plate had gone unnoticed despite being in, on public display. This coincidence regards the graph and stiff license plate, which reads a, uh, is that Roman numeral three or is that III 118 while typed it may look innocuous in person the eyes look like ones and as such the plate can be interpreted as a armistice for 11 11 18 which this would seem that the plate which had been confirmed as the plate the car of the car on the car during the event of the fame predicted the end of the war however it must be noted that austria hungary had been knocked out of the war a week earlier on November 4th, 1918. To read the full story and the of the unfounded curses surrounding the car, read this wonderful Smithsonian article. We're not going to do a that. I mean, the guy just told us most of them, but most of them seem to be um, superstition. True, the Black Volga spread across the Soviet Union in the 1960s and 70s. During this time, the people were living in fear of their government, and they began noticing black Volga limousines. Oh, yeah, the new cursed cars are the cyber trucks, right, Logan? Uh, you want to get a far, as far away from one of those, you see it barreling down the road. I drove a tow truck. Uh, the car I was towing were not trouble. The idiots that pulled out in front of me thinking I could stop on a dime were. Yeah, that's, that's the problem when you're driving a big rig at all would abduct people, especially children. The cars had a white curtain and rims. Some said the mirrors on the cars looked like horns. Others claimed the Volga was actually red, but no one could ever see the driver. Rumors began to circulate that the cars were actually driven by vampires, priests, nuns, Jews, Satanists, and even Satan himself. It is said that the driver would lure victims. Maybe they all carpool together to save on gas. I don't know what the fuel market in Russia was back then, but I could see a good reason for vampires and witches and devils and stuff to all want to carpool together just to make things a little more affordable. I'll pitch in a couple bucks for gas, or maybe they rotate who drives. Victims into the car by asking them for the time. If anyone else approached the car uninvited, they would be killed on the spot or die mysteriously exactly 24 hours later. Many think children were targeted. Killed on the spot is a little extreme, right? If they were killed on the spot, you think there'd be like dozens of police reports. Of course, this is coming from Russia, so. And remember, when I talked about Russia before, uh, Ali Ashanka, where they had the, the alien baby or whatever in the shoebox. And the cops are like, there's no alien baby in the shoebox. And the lady's like, no, here's my alien baby in the shoebox. And they're like, nope, we're taking you to the mental hospital. There's no alien baby in the shoebox. And then the alien baby in the shoebox died. And some guy found it and put it in his refrigerator. That's the kind of stuff that I, that, that I expect from the Russian police. So, targeted so their blood could be used to cure rich Arabs or Westerners who suffered from leukemia or other diseases. So their organs would be harvested and sold on the black market. So it's PizzaGate for uh, it's Russian PizzaGate with black cars. Volga limousines were one of the most expensive cars driven by high society Soviets, usually only belonging to the elite political officers who were responsible for the hardships and fears of its citizens. The legend of the Black Volga is believed to have been circulated by the Polish secret police. Uh, this is a small town of America too. In order to discredit the idea of actual secret kidnappings that were taking place that time in the Soviet state. President. So when we were when we were kids, there were it was white vans that were supposed to be 
grabbing people. Yeah, it was always, watch out for big white vans. Uh, and I was talking earlier about my big blue cargo van. Uh, that was, uh, people always would get suspicious about that. Because uh, I think I was like a, like a burglar or something when I park in front of my friend's house. The, I'd, I'd look out the window and the cops would be looking at my vehicle and running my plates and stuff. <laughs> and looking in my windows. And I'd look outside. And I was just a kid. I was like 16, 17 years old. I'm like, what the hell? The Black Volga is a European phenomenon of mysterious black cars said to be driven by various people in different accounts and abduct people. The story and other interpretations. The legend was spread through East Europe uh, in uh, the post-Iron Curtain communist reign. The story tells of a mysterious black Volga car that abducts people. The story differs on who was abducted and who was the driver. Some of the some have stated it was children who were abducted, while others say it was adults. The driver has been told as a secret police, Satan, demons, or other people of ethnic groups that have been told as monsters in their stories. Yeah, this is translated, by the way, so the pardon the broken English. Criminal conspiracy, the most common belief involving the Black Volga is that it was driven by a gang of criminals who use it to kidnap victims for use in organ harvesting or child slavery, since many targets were said to be children. There were also tales of it being used by a serial killer who would pull up to ask people the time. If the victim approached to do so, the killer would proceed to kidnap and murder them in a gruesome manner. Occult conspiracy, another common belief was that the Black Volga was a demonic entity used by Satan or other high-ranking spirits of evil to capture souls. Using a similar method to the serial killer story, in these stories the demonic car would ask for the time and anyone who answered was cursed to die at the same time that that next day, but could save themselves by replying, it is God's time, causing the demon to vanish. Other occult-based tales involving the Black Volga had it driven by cultists who would kidnap children for their blood rituals of or satanic ritual abuse. These stories sometimes also include members of the clergy, such as nuns or priests, further suggestive of a theistic Satanism. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, that that's probably the most out there of the of the theories uh, <laughs> possible truth while l largely just a series of urban legends the nature of the black volga myth may have been deliberately spread or intensified by polish secret police in order to make claims involving actual kidnapping kidnappings by the government seem uh invalid and ridiculous of course with all the conspiracy theories, this has never been proven, and as such, most agree the Black Volga is purely fiction. <laughs> here's, a, here's a list of possible explanations. Secre uh, rumor or hoax, secret police working for the Communist Party, demonic presence, uncaptured serial killer who kidnaps children and adults to later murder and maim them, possible... A uh, story told to scare children into behaving. Yeah, I'm thinking that's probably a, a viable one. Vampire drivers <laughs> who kidnap children and adults for sucking their blood. A ghostly presence. Nuns or priests. Satanist. A paranormal entity. The vehicle is driven by the devil himself. Powers and ability. Driving. Criminal resources. Supernatural abilities. The black vulva can be uh, a sedan or a limousine. The legend of the Black Volga originated in the Soviet age. The story seems to be slightly more obscure and Eastern European versions to the popular men in black urban legend. The story also bears resemblance to common stories of a stranger luring kids into a car or van told by parents to scare their children so they didn't talk to strangers. Yeah, stranger danger in the 80s and 90s was like a thing. I guess something was really pounded into us. They just scared of anybody who pulled up in a vehicle. <laughs> uh, oh, good morning, Ben. 
All right, the next one we have. John F. Kennedy's Navy Blue 1961 Lincoln 74A convertible was co-named the SS100X by the Secret Service. It was the car him and his wife Jackie were riding in on that fateful day in November of 1963 when he was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. Thank you. I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I did 90s thing. Even the makeup didn't turn out quite as good as I wanted, but I got, um, I used purple like eyeliner or eyeshadow. This is the, uh, like in the 90s, uh, Sumami called this my, <laughs> my, uh, Alex Mack sweater, because it's a big, giant, oversized, uh, brightly colored, like, Nintendo sweater, and then I got, like, a tie-dye hat, and did the, the, uh, 90 tw 90s tween makeup look, um, yeah, I was really excited to do it, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had some glitter, though, because the 90s tween look has to have glitter. The car had over $200,000 worth of modifications on it, but strangely, it wasn't bulletproof. It left the president completely exposed to the unseen gun. It's hard to be bulletproof when you're a convertible. There were several modified domes built to fit on top of the convertible, but they made the car hot and uncomfortable without adding much protection to the president. The Lincoln is supposedly haunted by the ghosts of Kennedy, yet it was surprisingly kept in service for eight more years after the president's assassination. The Secret Service ensured that proper reinforcements and safety measures were added to the car that were missing before it went back into service. It was lined with titanium armor. So, I mean, it sounds like maybe the climate control inside was the problem. Well, I have glitter lip gloss. Um, I'm not actually a big fan of loose glitter. Because um, it's bad, well, it's bad for a lot of creatures, but... Um, I, I do like uh, like glitter uh, eyeshadow, and I had some glitter eyeshadow too, and I don't know what happened to it. Plating, a permanent bulletproof roof, and bullet resistant glass. President Johnson had the car painted black, so it wouldn't be as reminiscent of that terrible day in 1963. The presidential limo was finally replaced in 1967, but the 1961 Lincoln was used for other duties until it was finally retired in the Henry Ford Museum in 1978. An apparition of a man dressed in... Wow, they, uh, they kept that thing com commissioned. Yeah, I know, glitter lotion, that's another one, or body cream. Um, yeah. Sparkle in the sun. Uh, but I can't believe they kept that, kept the car running that long in, in the government. I would think that, like, today... I imagine every administration ha goes through, uh, within the four-year period, probably a few different cars. But I guess it wasn't the same in the 60s and 70s. Gray is often seen standing near their car. He is most often seen near the anniversary of Kennedy's assassination in November. In 19... I've actually been to where Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, though. Um, went down there for Christmas in... I want to say 2002 three and went down to by the way dallas's uh train station is amazing probably the the coolest train station i've ever been to st louis train station just i mean the time i went to anyway it kind of sucked it's better now i think you got stuff to do there now but i digress uh i did go to the to the place where kennedy was shot and he kind of does give you an eerie feel in 1954, classic film star James Dean developed a love for cars and racing. After filming e Who's ready for the poor spider, guys? This is the last one, too. East of Eden, he purchased various vehicles, including a Porsche 356 and a Triumph Tiger. He began competing in novice-class car races and hoped to one day compete in the Indianapolis 500. But on September 30th, 1955, James was driving his Porsche 550 Spider. To a race in Salinas, California. He had named the car Little Bastard, and that evening it lived up to it when James lost control and flipped it into a gully. The wreck severely injured the passenger in the car, but James wasn't as lucky. He was pronounced dead on arrival at a nearby hospital. Yet that yeah, so the death of James Dean, right? She we were supposed to go back and talk about the Kennedy. This is just a short um, blurb about it. Let me just we'll rewind, um, and I'll just go over this real quick. Welcome back. Today we have a Saturday. 
cars. Uh, most of, of us either witnessed the Kennedy assassination at the hands of Lee Harvey Oswald, either on live television or through pictures and videos in sophomore American history class in high school. Many of us are also familiar with the various conspiracy theories surrounding the shooter, such as the widely debunked theory of a second sniper, or we've heard about the strange coincidence between Kennedy, Kennedy's assassination and that of Abraham Lincoln by John Wilkes Booth. However, what many don't know is that is the history of Kennedy's haunted convertible limousine. In previous posts, we explored the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand while he was in his personal limousine, which it, we just found out it wasn't his personal limousine. It was rented or uh, it was provided by another uh, Archduke. And given the circumstances of Kennedy's death, it would seem that heads of state and motor vehicles are often particularly vulnerable. The key factor to in both of these incidents uh, is the convertible top. Both uh, Francis's Graf and, and Stift double phaeton and the Kennedy SS100X were rag tops, which left both men particularly vulnerable during parades or just driving around town. However, when where Archduke had terribly bad luck to run into his shooter on a side street, Kennedy's assassination was thoroughly planned and executed during a parade in Dallas. One of the most interesting aspects of the Lincoln 74A convertible that the Secret Service nicknamed the SS100X was that it was it's $200,000 worth of upgrades and modifications, none of which included a bulletproof panel of glass, <laughs> unfortunately. That would uh, equal just short of $1.68 million uh, in, dollars in 2019 when this article was written. It wasn't until Lyndon B. Johnson was set to take office that the vehicle received titanium armor, bulletproof glass, and a bulletproof roof. Johnson had the car painted black in remembrance of his predecessor and to dissuade any Latin feelings uh, associated with the previous navy blue. Many people claim that uh, it was simply the fact that Kennedy was in the Lincoln in the first place that was a bad omen, while others feel that the Secret Service should have learned from Franz Ferdinand's assassination. Either way, many individuals have reported seeing an ephemeral man in a gray suit near the vehicle or even reflected in the mirror or on the gloss in the paint especially during the month of november which is basically what that guy just said to us now the thing about this is that the secret service didn't learn i like i like that point of view like not necessarily secret service but like we still have yeah, I mean, Trump got took a bullet, I guess, to the ear. Because <laughs> um, we still let our uh, politicians become easy targets. We put them in places where outside someone can easily shoot them. <laughs> and then we like, oh, man, someone's trying to shoot our leaders. But I digress. Let's get back to Little Bastard. It wasn't the end of Little Bastard. James's friend, George Barris, took what was left of the car and sold its parts to other drivers. The drivetrain and engine went to two doctors who shared the same dangerous passion for racing that James had. The two men entered the same race and both were involved in horrific crashes. One was killed and the other was severely injured. This convinced George that Little Bastard was cursed and he donated the remains of the car to the California Highway Patrol. They wanted to display the car as a warning to other drivers, but the building they had it on display burned down. The only thing left in the debris of the fire was Little Bastard. So the highway patrol began doop, doop, doop. And taking the car to schools to warn careless teenagers of the dangers of the road. On its way to one school, the cursed car broke free from its hauler and caused another fatal car accident. While at another school, the car got loose from its display and fell, breaking a student's hip. Oh. The car fell from a trailer transporting it again and crushed an unfortunate driver. Finally, two thieves were injured when they attempted to steal the blood-stained car seats and steering wheel. This prompted the highway patrol to return the remains of Little Bastard to George. 
but they mysteriously disappeared from the flatbed truck that was returning them. Doop, doop, the cursed doop. car hasn't been seen since. Who knows if that was truly the end of Little Bastard. Thanks for watching, strangers. This video was suggested by our subscriber, Johnny Firehead. Alright, uh, so that's, that's the Little Bastard coverage, but let's, uh, let's read a little bit about Little Bastard, too, while we're here. The haunting story of James, James Dean's Little Bastard. James Dean's career as an actor and racer was cut tragically short on September 30th, 1955, when his Little Bastard, Porsche uh, 550 Spider, was involved in a catastrophic collision on the way to a race meeting. Dean was killed instantly, but Little Bastard would go on to cause considerably more trouble. That's what it looked like after Dean's wreck. Uh, the fact, in fact, Little Bastard has caused upset, had, had caused upset almost from the moment Dean bought it. A week before the fatal crash, Dean met British actor Alec Guinness in Los Angeles. Guinness had an ominous feeling on seeing the Porsche and would later write in his diary, The sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry, feeling a little ill-tempered in spite of Dean's kindness. I heard myself say in a voice I could hardly recognize as my own, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you'll be found dead in it the next this time next week. That's Alec Guinness, who played Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original uh, Star Wars series. Uh, Dean laughed it off and said about preparing the car for uh, Salinas sports uh, car races with his Porsche mechanic, Rolf Wutherick enlisting stuntman Bill Hickman to help out. The original plan was to tow Little Bastard to the race, or to the races, but uh, Werther Wretch uh, felt it would be better for Dean to get used to the spider and run in the run of its engines. Uh, in On that faithful Friday, uh, Werther Wretch sat next to Dean while Hickman followed with his truck and trailer. Police pulled over the convoy and issued a pair of speeding tickets just outside Bakersfield. Uh, it didn't slow Dean down one bit. Dean was barreling down Route 466 at the estimated 85 miles an hour when a young Cal Poly student named Donald uh, Turnip Speed? Turnip Seed? Turnip Seed. Yeah, there you go. Driving a Ford Tudor. Uh, decided to make a sudden turn onto Route 140, or sorry, Route 41. The impact sent the Ford almost 40 feet down the road and ejected a Werther Rich from the Porsche. Dean was pronounced dead on arrival at the uh, Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital at 6.20 p.m. Despite being declared a total loss by insurance companies, the car was sold on and would continue to cause carnage whenever it or even parts of it went. Dr. William S. Rich, who bought the Porsche from a salvage yard in Burbank and proceeded to strip it for parts, S. Rich uh, installed the Porsche's engine into his Lotus 4, or sorry, Lotus 9 uh, race car, then lo loaned the transmission and suspension parts to fellow doctor and racer Troy McHenry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Eshrich crashed the Lotus at the 1956 Pomona sports car races, surviving, but McHenry wasn't as lucky. He hit three trees and was killed in the same race, and so the curse of Little Bastard gained some strength. There it is. Dean's Porsche itself carried on... Shortly after the crash, publicity mongers and self-proclaimed king of customs, George Barris, bought the spider, promising to rebuild it. When the mangled frame was found to be beyond recovery, Barris chose to capitalize on the car's notoriety. The Porsche was loaned to the Los Angeles chapter of National Safety Council in 19, from 1957 to 1959. It went on a gruesome tour on car shows, movie theaters, and bowling alleys. In March of 1959, while in storage in Fresno, the car mysteriously caught fire. It suffered remarkably little damage to melted tires uh, and some singed paint. 
And fortunately, the fire didn't spread to other vehicles in the stores. That's funny because just a minute ago, that guy telling the story was like, oh, it burned the whole place down. The only thing left was little bastard. No, it, didn't, it wasn't like that. Meanwhile, Barris had sold a pair of tires from the 550 and both reportedly blew at the same time, causing the new owner to career, uh, I think it's probably supposed to be Kareen, Kareen off the road. There are other unconfirmed stories of little bastards post-accident life. The car is said to have fallen from its display while on show in Sacramento, breaking the hip of a bystander. The spider also reportedly fell on and killed George Barkas, the driver who transported it to a road safety expo. Finally, the Porsche is rumored to have disappeared from a sealed boxcar in 1960 while en route to Miami, uh, from Miami to Los Angeles. Some believe Barris uh, ever the showman fabricated the story as a way to keep the car's mystique alive. Despite a million dollar reward for information being offered in 2005, Little Bastard's whereabouts remain unknown. With Barris himself now gone and no sign of the car for 60 years, the end of Little Bastard's haunting story may never be revealed. All right. Well, so, yeah, the strangest does uh well videos about strange stuff so we may see them again hell's gate bridge alabama we got chernobyl the gaffney visitor Let's see unsolved J japan mysteries abandoned haunted five deep wood monsters yes yeah, so there's a lot to uh maybe delve into here if we wanted to there's the dover demon a review of the bad seed. We were supposed to watch that and gather one of these days. So, yeah. Anyway, so what do you all think? Uh, is it possible for a car to you know, carry on bad memories or bad juju from a previous owner or accident and pass it forward? I don't think so. I think this is just another example of like King Tut's curse or the Hope Diamond's curse or any of that stuff. That there's nothing really substantial to it. It's just drawing... Uh, it's drawing patterns where there are none because humans were pattern seeking apes and that's what we do we seek out patterns so even when there aren't any we'll make up our own let me know though in the comments down below what you think uh, of uh, this mysterious vehicle all right and please remember to be kind take care and we'll see you next time